interest rates are tied to the uh, five-year treasury. This is, a, you know, if you want to understand where rates are, if you're like, oh, I wonder if they're up, down, left, right, sideways, are my buyers actually legitimate when they say, oh, well, the bank is offering me, well, I got quoted at seven and a half percent, six and a half percent, seven, whatever. And you're like, well, I don't know if that's actually true. If you're wondering where rates are going, um, that's sort of where, you know, a lot of uh, what me and David try to give you is clarity on where we are today and how to tackle the daily um, and current situation of the economic standpoint of commercial real estate. So uh, right now you can see, you see this number here, which is the 4.341. This is what the uh, the five-year treasury is at. Uh, David and uh, has alluded to, uh, and I have been talking about for many years uh, together, and we're coming here to, to give you an idea that typically rates float at about one and a half to 3% higher than this number. Obviously, depending on the bank, depending on the deal, depending on the term of uh, the, the type of loan, loans are hovering in this range, right? And obviously like the one and a half percent, David, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, the high five range is probably going to be on massive CMBS loans, amazing class A product with good DSCR coverage, right? You probably can get a decent CMBS loan for a high five right now. And then uh, everything else, community banks, regional banks, local banks, and the like are probably pushing numbers in the mid to high sixes, mid to low sevens pretty regularly, depending on the debt service coverage ratio and the relationship with the with the bank that they have. It sounds about right. Yes, correct. So, so yeah, so CMBS generally runs on um, the the five year will run about three hundred basis points above above Treasury um, or you know between two. I, I want to say between two fifty and three hundred. The ten year it runs about one eighty, one fifty to one eighty above Treasury. So yeah, on a, on a ten year, I mean you're you're looking at you're looking at uh, you know high fives. The reason why is because they get everyone along the way, uh, meaning the the bank originator of the CMBS, the people they sell it to, the people they sell to, everyone gets a little spread off that off the spread. The starting point for anyone is the is the treasury the reason why is because any investor any hedge fund um investment bank anyone who ultimately will will hold these notes and collect the payments every month they start off at the treasury right zero risk treasury if if they're getting 4.347 today then they are not going to take any risk to receive 4.347 obviously they have an alternative option with zero risk the only reason anybody would invest would be to get a higher yield, you know, and, and then there's a trade-off, you know, risk to yield. CMBS is low risk. It's comparable to treasury with some very low level risk. So they will be willing to take a small spread above the treasury, but they'll never be at treasury clearly when they can choose treasury and get the same returns. That's ultimately the thinking. So the spread, when, when we say, you know, 200 above treasury, that's because that's two points, 200 basis points above treasury. Everyone along the way is taking a little bit of that every month, right? The bank that originated is taking a little bit of that. The brokers can add on to that and take a little bit of that every 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 month. Um, you know, all the middlemen, all the all the 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 rating agencies and the brokers and and you know the the back end, the B piece guys, all the the guys involved take a little bit along the way. Ultimately, the end buyer might end up with 100 basis points above treasury, which will be worth their risk. That's basically how it's priced. For CMBS loans, which is uh, something that we're going to dive into today, those are the types of loans for much larger product, right? Like this is for properties uh, that are typically above a $5 million loan amount. Right, typically. Yeah, yeah. You can get you can get CMBS will range. I mean, you you can get like a two, three, three. We just did a three and a, a three and a half million. That was the smallest one in the in this tranche. All the banks aggregate them every month or so and sell them off once a month. And this is what, um, you know, and, and like, this is mortgage backed securities essentially, right? This is what uh, people are wondering, like what a CMBS loan is, right? This is mortgage backed securities that these huge hedge funds are buying, right? Like you guys know in 2008, you know, the, the big short, you guys were wondering what that was, right? Mortgage backed securities is basically a whole bundle of loans that are being packaged together and as sold then to these huge organizations. So they can um, essentially be making a very modest rate of return on the investment, right? You know, try to like get basically get as close to a CD or a bond as they can, right? Um, it's just another type of financial instrument that they can invest in. So and we're going to talk about CMBS loans, how they work, the type of, uh, actually, sorry, we're going to talk about DSCR today. Today we're doing DSCR. But anyway, in the, in the next week, we'll talk about CMBS, um, I think was the way we had it structured, right? Most people here are not going to be using many CMBS loans. Uh, it will be on occasion, but I think DSCR will probably be a little bit more common. So I wanted to speak with that first, then we'll go to CMBS next week. So, uh, but anyways, this is just to give you an idea, again, like kind of where banks are at right now. 
uh, we're obviously kind of ticking up in the wrong direction, you know, based on the sentiment of, you know, where inflation is and all these other things. So, but what's interesting, David, and again, well, uh, just to touch on before we dive into, by the way, if you guys have questions or anything that you want us to specifically dive into today around the underwriting training, if you have a deal you want us to underwrite, if you have questions about underwriting, if you have anything specifically around underwriting deals, rates, loans, anything, drop it in the chat box down below or raise your little virtual hand, we'll go in order. Just want to let you know you can do that. The one thing, David, I just want to ask your opinion on, which is because we're seeing this here, right? We're, we're seeing this climb, sadly, in the wrong direction, which is kind of incredibly un, uh, unfortunate based on where things are at today. But we really haven't seen much of a difference in rates. You know what I mean? Like overall, it's not like rates went from even the peak here of 4.98888 rate of 4.99 all the way down to this this um, this trough here of 3.7 to now where we are at the 4.3, I don't really feel like we've had much real difference in pricing, right? It's been fairly steady. Yeah, you, you we haven't seen a huge dip. The reason why is, I mean, well, the truth is, and if you're doing CMBS, you you are seeing, you, you are seeing, uh, you know, it, it fluctuates in perfect tandem with with the market. It's, it's perfectly, to the minute, Avoid. you know, it's just a mathematical formula spread. There's so, no. So, so literally um, from like, if you were trying to get a loan here at four, where I'm trying to get to this peak here, here you go. At Dece uh, October 19th, if someone went to rate, rate lock at this point, you would have had the highest. You would have been at like, let's just say 1.8 ish over the 499 versus somebody who is smart enough to wait or who had the ability to wait to December 27th would have been at nearly a 1.2 basis points less. That is correct. So we actually just closed a CMBS loan here at the firm. We started, you see, you see that dip in J January, 2024. Yep. Yeah. Right over there, the 10 year and the five year, they're pretty much in, in tandem where it was, was about 3.8. We quoted the guy, we said, okay, you're, you're about 300 point, uh, basis points above treasury. Uh, we quoted him at, at you know, 6.75, 6.8. And he was thrilled. We locked it the day before closing. His rate was seven point eight. It was a full point above. And, and keep in mind, this is a big loan. So you're talking about you're talking about extra, you know, ten fifteen thousand dollars a month in additional payments just because of that. And he was, you know, he was frustrated. Um, but again, like there's there's literally nothing to do. You you float with the market. It's a market based product. That's one of the downsides of the market. You can't go and you know just uh, you can't really know what's going to be. In all in, in all honesty, uh, the past. 20 years or so there there hasn't really been fluctuations from 2019 from when prior to covid to 2008 the fluctuations were were nominal you're talking about at the third degree you know past past the decimal point so you're talking about 0 0.001 or 0 0.02 changes you're talking about nominal differences we're having crazy fluctuations i mean yeah you look at that you're looking at you know three point over over a bunch of years i mean 2011 to 2019 like it, right. it kind of bumped up you know you know a half a point and that's over that's over a lot of a lot of years i mean that's over eight years so so if you look at over any you know time from when you would start the process to three months later or two months later when you finish the process you didn't have, you know, a full point jump. So we're in we're in a very strange financial time. So you're having these like massive up and down fluctuations, you know, with jobs reports because you know the Fed may increase, the Fed, you know, may decrease rates. That never happened. I mean, to, I don't know if you guys followed the the Fed, you know, prior to 2019, but there was no talk about raising rates or lowering rates on a on a monthly basis. That happened maybe once a year, uh, maybe not even. They just you know kept things steady. So things were very relatively steady so yeah you're, you're in this really weird time now uh, agreed here i'm gonna stop sharing uh and i'm gonna give you host if you want to bring up your worksheet uh for the dscr loans i'm just gonna go through some really quick questions while you're doing that rodney says do people try to lock in cmbs loans sooner rather uh than others uh, given that they follow the market so closely to avoid the example that you just mentioned it's not possible um they don't give you that option you you lock you have to lock within 24 hours of closing, right? And the reason why is because they, they're they selling it off basically post-closing. Yeah, the people who are doing the loan are intermediaries, kind of very similar to residential loans, believe it or not, where you know you have the mortgage bank, they might fund it out of a line, right? So you have this bank, whichever bank is doing CMBS, they have this massive line, you know, half, half a billion dollar line of credit. Their line of credit floats, they fund it out and basically lock the day of closing. They pull their money out of their line the day of closing or the day prior. I think within it has to be within 24 hours of close. And then they they go ahead and um, sell that off on the secondary market with a spread. There are, you know, so they can't go two months earlier and just 
guess the rate because then they might actually lose money. Um, the market is only buying it the day the market buys it. They don't care when you started the process. Goldman Sachs and, and BlackRock and New York Life Co. who are buying these notes, they, they want to return on their capital the, the day they they invest their capital, which is at post-closing. Very different than residential. Like there is no rate locking infinitely before. Oh, right. Know. Sorry. Yeah. In that sense, in that sense, it's completely different. So the process is like on the back end is, is like Resi where they will fund it and sell it, but there's no rate lock like Resi. They they only establish rate locks on Resi because it became, it's completely unviable to have a market where, you know, somebody, uh, your standard mom, you know, mom and pop retail guy wants to buy a house. You can't have a market where people cannot know what their rates are. Or they don't know if they're qualified. They can't go into contract if the, if the rates are going to change. So they, you have this you have this lock period that was built in. It's a separate insurance company. It's a separate um, rate lock company that takes that risk. It's a hedging company. So there's a cost to it. When, when a bank locks on the resi side, they're not they're not locking. They're paying a company to assume that risk for them, like an insurance company. That's so interesting. And it's, it's wild. It's wild. So so you know like calls and puts on the stock market. So you always have people who are assuming it's going to go up or down. The, that those people who they pay an insurance company who ba basically moves it further, but there are people out there who are buying that risk, the option to which um, is why, like, if it goes past the rate lock date, you have to pay extension fees and everything because correct. So the bank is not keeping that; they're passing that on to keep their lock active because you know there are people who who they're paying the investors who are taking that risk to say, okay, if it goes up, we make money. It, sorry, the opposite. If the rate goes down and we're getting more money for 30 years because you locked it, spread. we get some small spread um, versus the other way. So it's a completely separate instrument and market and companies that do that rate lock. It is possible there is that in the CMBS world. I don't know of it. Most people don't do that, but you can independently go and rate lock anything. There, there's literally like me as a, as a buyer can say, hey, I don't know the price of you know goods or mortgages or you know materials, lumber, gold. It doesn't matter. There's a market out there to rate lock uh, a, a, a specific price today. And somebody's out there, you're going to find someone in a, in a market to take that risk uh, that it's going to go the other way that, that you think it may go. You're locking because you don't want it to go up. Obviously, if you think it would be going down, you wouldn't rate lock at a higher rate, right? So you're trying to protect your, your downside, which is the rate going up and your cost going up. There's somebody out there who thinks it's going to go down. They're happy to give you this rate lock now because they think tomorrow it's going to be lower or or next week. So that's that's a completely separate instrument that gets kind of like purchased in the process, mm -hmm. um, which the bank actually does because the bank doesn't sell their loan the day they fund it. They it takes about thirty days to fund. So, I was say, so they actually do I, purchase. Because I, I was going to ask you, like, okay, so CMBS, it's like the day or like twenty four hours before closing for bank loans, DSCR loans, hard money loans, right, regional bank loans, all those types of loans. How how soon can you lock there? You can lock 30 days earlier, usually. So you just lumped in a whole bunch of stuff. The SCR loans, you can generally lock. There are markets for that, very active markets, and, and you can lock 30 days before, generally speaking. Bank loans, there's a variety of different options. Some banks will not lock until the day of closing. Um, it depends really what happens with the money afterwards. What, what happens with the note after? Are, are they selling it? Are they holding it on their books? Sometimes they will give you the option to purchase a rate lock. They'll say, okay, here, we, we priced it in the market, and this is what it is. You know, you pay pay a quarter point of your of the amount that you expect to get the loan amount and you will rate lock they'll just do that work for you to price it in the market but really you know and, and then sometimes they, they'll they'll just lock and take that risk on their own so it really depends on the bank and um, what their back end is post closing here's what we're going to do and i'll try to kind of work with it as we go this is kind of our setup that that i always work off of very very simple um this is a completely fictitious property we're just taking these numbers what i want to do is compare side to side ultimately bank to DSCR loan um, and kind of see what the benefits and what the positives and negatives are. So let's start with with kind of high level. Uh, what What is a DSCR loan? Let's go back to that initial uh, sheet that we can just kind of review really quickly. Um, this section is DSCR loans. I can make it a drop larger if you need. But this is, this is DSCR loans, right? So you've got terms 30 years almost, you know, and, and that's fixed. So you don't have to pay it off. There's no five year. There's no balloon payment. It's, you can hold it for 30 years. Rates are kind of high. I mean, they've moved up. I would say now um, there is 7.75 to, you know, 9.25. So they moved up again. Again, they moved to the treasury. The treasury moved up a point. Everything else kind of moved up with it. 9.25. This is kind of the range we're seeing now. Um, it's not interest only. It's a step down prepay, right? So you're going to get a either a 321 or a five, four, three, two, one. Guys familiar with prepays? We covered that. I don't remember. I'll just write yes. Guys familiar with prepays? Uh, you know, it's just kind of 
a, a three to one means in year one, if you want, if you were to pay off the loan, you would be paying three percent. Year two, you'd be paying two. Year three, you'd be paying one. A five four three to one is the same thing, just over five years. So that that's the prepay penalty. LTVs you're getting is you're getting high LTVs, like nice LTVs, seventy five to eighty, um, which is really good um, these days. And this is probably the most common loan you're gonna you're, you're gonna be dealing with at the beginning. Um, for a term loan. It's a lot easier than bank. It takes quick two to four weeks, right? Kind of like the same speed as hard money. Banks can take, you know, three, four months. Um, you don't need financials and and you have very low expense ratios. Personal. So no financial, personal, personal financials. Yeah. The only thing they look at is the property financials. So income and expenses on the property. So, and again, I you, want to make sure I'm speaking, speaking so everyone hears this, right? Which is like, I walk in, I make a hundred grand a year, net taxable or so. Um, got like 25 grand in the bank, but I am, um, I found a really, really good deal. It's a 10 unit apartment complex. The guy wants 2 million bucks, the debt service and all the thing, all the numbers pencil, and I can raise some money. Can I go buy this deal? Even though I don't have the money in there or the credit or. Yes. Yes, you can. That's, what's really good about it. You can buy, even if you make $0, literally $0, you have not filed tax returns. You can, you can buy a property, right? So this is really, really good for, you know, your first 10 properties or so, um, small. Now th there's, there are limitations. The limitations are up to eight units. Okay. That means a multifamily, not, not eight. You can buy as many individual properties as you want, but, eight units, um, in, in, in up eight to eight units. units, rental units in one. Okay. So that's the limitation. You could do build a rank. Okay. You could do mixed use. So this is good for very, this is for like, like you had mentioned first few properties, smaller product. Correct. Correct. Smaller products. Typically it's up to $2 million loan size. So it's not tiny, but I mean, you can't do, you can't do a $10 million loan. You, can, you know, 2 million is really the the max here. You're saying 2 million loan size. 2 million loan size. So it's about a $3 million purchase yeah. or, or 2.5 purchase. All right. So that's, that's the kind of the good, the bad. All right. Mixed use. Um, it's only resi and small mixed use. Mixed use meaning you can have uh, a retail store on the first floor. Mixed use cannot be over 50% of income and or 50% of space, Got square it. footage. So again, not for industrial, not for regular retail strip centers. This is specifically for apartment buildings, small apartment buildings. So like, um, again, a single family house all the way up to an eight unit apartment complex or a part, uh, retail down below and apartments upstairs, but the retail can't be more than 50% of the square footage or the income of the property. Correct. DSCR is really great because it goes up to, goes below one, right? Just to remind you, one. you can go below one. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. I hope people understand that. Can you explain what that means? Because I, I this, yeah. this did as crazy yeah, as I it could. Happened. And it's amazing and it gets even better. Um, the way they calculate DSCR is not the way DSCR is calculated for banks. So, so there's kind of a misalignment with just with just the the vocabulary. But we'll we'll get into that. It's very 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 important to know. And this is why it's, this this is a real winner in this market. This is why 80% of the loans we're doing are DSCR. Okay. So 0.75 means your income is 75% of your expenses. Right, which is bad. You you want your income to be over your expenses. And we're expenses talking, we're including... specifically talking net operating income versus debt service. That's what we're specifically talking about here. Correct, but there are some caveats to that, which we'll get really granular in a minute. But correct, your 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 NOI is lower. Can can be can be lower than your payments by twenty five percent. So I don't know why. I don't know. I cannot tell you who's buying this loan where your expenses are higher than your income. I mean, it's got to be, you got to be really stupid to invest in a building where you can't do it. And we're not talking about a hard money loan where there's a value add in three months, you know, you'll be cash flowing. Like, you're talking about a 30 year loan this way, but there are, there's a market for this and there are p people investing in this. It's good to know. Um, now why you want to do it? I don't know. I don't know why you, you should buy a building where your, you cannot what, cash. What was the flow. lowest debt service coverage ratio you've ever written a loan for? Oh, that's that's uh, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, we've done this. You know, 0.75. Um, we've had people who come in and they're they're losing money every month and they're buying it anyway. Sometimes it makes <laughs> sense. I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, if you're buying in an area where you think you the market's going up, right? You got a lot of you guys are realtors, if if not all of you, right? Market. You, you know, you know, you know, a market is turning over. You see the price is going, you see a, a house, right? And and every every month the price goes up by 10%. Every listing goes up by 20%. You may want to buy there expecting, you know, the value will be 
much, much higher and you'll just do a refi in, you know, in, in a year. So th there, there are use cases for this, but I mean, again, you're putting up money every month out of pocket to, to make your payments mm -hmm. in this scenario. All right, listen, it's cool. It works for people. It's cool to know you can actually get a loan below your income on the property. So the, the, and without the showing real value interest. here is trying to find the oper the deals that are smaller mixed use, smaller mixed use, or just or smaller apartment buildings where you have a, a great DSCR, like a very strong DSCR, where you can cash flow like crazy day one and get some fantastic returns and you don't have to go through the craziness of all of the docs, you know, providing all your bank statements and all of your tax returns and all your yada, yada, yada. But just by finding a very strong asset, you could have no money in the bank. You could have no tax return filed. You could literally, if you find somebody you could raise money from, you could buy a deal. That is correct. Love it. That's correct. Um, and and uh, that's why it's really, really good right now where rates are high and banks are just killing people and giving you 60%. And you, you can literally, this is one of the few outlets and you can actually buy a property with. So um, really good to know. Um, correct. Small, multifamily, single family, eight, up to eight units. Really, really easy. Quick. Two, two to four weeks, you're closed. You can do a 30-day contract. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it's, it's, it's really good. And then uh, so yeah. I see that you say no construction. So like this does not include... Uh, a construction loan. Um, Correct. You, this needs to be a cash flowing loan. It could actually, actually, um, just a couple of points. First of all, this rate range, you do get hit on the rates, meaning the lower the DSCR. If you're at one, two or one, three, you're getting the lower end of this spectrum versus if you're 0.75, you're going to be get, you know, it's going to go above. It's it's really going to be like 10%. So you, like, double, so you, so get, double screwed. you get double screwed because as your rate goes up, your payments go up, which means your DSCR goes down, which means you know, you got to find, you, you just mess with, you mess with the whole deal. Um, no construction. Correct. You want these to be, you actually could have vacancies. Um, you don't need it to be cash flow, which is crazy as well. You just, they will ask the appraiser to give you market rent. The appraiser will find comps of rent, rental comps, and they'll apply that as if there's a tenant there, even when there's no tenant, which is something banks will not do. So you can actually have a vacant apartment, right? You have a house, no tenant. You can buy it with a, 30 year loan based on the future income of this building without your own income. So they go off of uh, very good market rate assumptions of vacant units. Yeah. So by and the way, Dominique is asking, why would anybody lend on this? Wouldn't this just foreclose? Typically, yeah, that's a good question. Some money in the bank. I don't know. I don't know the answer. There are people doing it. I don't know why. There, there are large insurance companies and hedge funds. They have to put out money. My guess is that their short term returns are, are really nice to their investors and they're kind of kicking the can down the road. It's kind of this, these are like subprime pre 2008 type of loans where you're not, it doesn't make any sense, but people are still doing it. And I, I also but that's my guess. Imagine, I guess like, most people aren't stupid, right? I mean, most people are not going to get into a, a, a day, a DSCR loan and lose money day one. Like, like, of course you've done it, but the amount of them is probably substantial. Like you're probably have like one one person from every every 10 20 30 50 loans you do will actually ever do something at a negative dscr uh, uh, absolutely correct because it makes no sense i mean 95 to 99 i want to say percent exactly. um of, of people have have a one to 1.2 dscr so now so one dscr is tight as well not high 90 percent as you said is above 1.25 which makes sense because yes. obviously like, people yes. are not in the business of losing money Correct. People are not buying a property to lose money. So, so you know, the option exists. It's good to know, but like, it just doesn't make any sense for a buyer. It doesn't make any sense for the bank. The option exists for those use cases, you know, one out of a hundred that, you, you know, there's actually a good reason for it, which sometimes there is. Yeah. Um, so Rodney goes in here and asks questions here is saying, do uh, DSCR loans allow for second mortgages? So like, is this something where we could structure a seller financing play where they're, they're seller financing friendly or how would, because I obviously you and I always uh, talk about trying to get some seller financing yeah. options. Is this something where we can structure it? What actually happens if you do it anyway? Probably nothing. Again, again I want to be clear. This is not, this is not a legal question. You can legally do what put whatever loans on the property you want. You are this is a, a con contractual question. When yeah, you sign a, a loan, this is a covenant, all right? A, like basically a covenant agreement, which is basically some type of contractual contractual agreement. When you sign on the loan docs, you are stating that the bank is in first position and there is no other liens, or you will not put any more liens on the property. Correct. And if you do, you have a penalty, which the bank, which gives the bank a right to default. That's your that's your penalty. The bank can say, oh. You know, it's as if you didn't pay. You, you're you in default. It's a technical default. You can default by not paying, obviously, but you can also default by uh, breaking any covenant in the contract, and then you're defaulting on your contract. 
right? So this is would be one of those defaults. So does the bank actually check? Is there anywhere to check? How would the bank even know? These are all you know good questions. Sometimes you record a, a second lien. Sometimes you don't record it. Sometimes you record it. It just goes on an operating agreement where you know it's basically like bringing in a partner. Um, and then, and then within that agreement, you will you will give preferred equity or preferred rights to one partner. Again, like if you were to go to the bank and ask them, well, well, I've done it. You and definitely the bank don't talk to the could, bank and ask them. Yeah, don't ask them. But if you do, they'll <laughs> most likely say we have no clue. We don't read on our loan docs. No. Talk to our lawyer. I've had this so many times. Bank, the banks themselves don't really care. They care about one thing. They they want to get paid every month. They don't want to have problems from you. That's all they care about. So you had mentioned you could use this loan 10 times at $2 million each based on what you were mentioning because they have a loan loan maximum of 2 million bucks. You can get this a hundred times, yeah. You said you could do it a hundred? Yeah, there's no limit. This is not, there's no limit okay. to how many of these loans you can take. Got it. So zero, okay, awesome, awesome. There's $2 million per- Per loan. Property, per loan. Yeah. You can do you can do a thousand, you can do 10,000, well, right? So yeah, yeah, no, no limit. Uh, and then uh, what kind of vacancy rate typically do underwriters or lenders like yourself typically look at for these types of deals that are like these smaller deals? Are you looking at like a five, maybe a 10% vacancy? Does it okay, depend so on let's, let, that's a good question. Let, let's segue into the actual underwriting because you, you, be, you might be surprised here. Oh, sorry. Here it is. You might be surprised here. Um, this, is, this is also a really big disconnect between using the word DSCR. So I'm, I, I mean, using the word... Um, yeah, DSCR. So let's let's let me kind of write this out here for anyone who wants to see it. So here here's bank definition of DSCR, and here's DSCR definition of DSCR. The bank definition of DSCR is again we're talking equal, about a bank loan versus a DSCR loan definition. NOI divided by payment debt service, and that's very simple. So here, here we're going to have the bank side. Let's take a look at what that means, right? You have a gross income, you have a vacancy factor, you have effective gross income, you got all these expenses, and then you have your NOI. Your gross is 90, your NOI is 55. Then the bank will divide that by your pity, right? You have 55 versus Principal 47 interest. is 1.16. It's not going to work. If you do a, a smaller loan amount, you do uh, 70. Basically, this is not going to work, but that's how the bank underwrites it for our purposes right now. And again, it doesn't work real quick because typically banks will only look at a 1.25 right? 1.3 debt service coverage. Correct. 1.25 to 1.3 debt service ratio. Correct. So this is not going to work. You're not going to get a loan. Um, to keep putting down more and more money until they can figure out exactly where until, you can. Until it works. Exactly. So that's the bank definition. Here, here's DSCR definition. Gross income divided by pity, right? Pity stands for principal interest, taxes, and, and insurance. Let's just do a real life formula. All right, let's use this. Here, what is your... You your... just hit equals, right? Like, so the equals on the bank right now would be the 1.6, right? You could just have it equal. Right. Same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Equal. So for the bank side, it's easy. We're, the, the problem is I didn't finish the formulas here. So um, I can take over talking while you do this if you want. So banks will will start here. Okay. The SCR starts with the gross income over pity. So they'll start here. So off the bat, you've got, generally speaking, double. No vacancy factor, no management fees, and none of these fees. The only fees that go into play and expenses are literally... These two, taxes and insurance. So not only, let's let's jump back. Not only are you getting 0.75 DSCR in a, in a worst case, or even or even let's call it 1.2 or, or 1.3. A bank will say 1.3, DSCR will say 1.3. These mean different things completely. These are completely different numbers. Very important to know. I mean, their DSCR, when when a, when is is literally taking your 90,000, looking at your your debt service. You know, rates are higher. Okay, so it's, let's say eight point seven five. You're at fifty grand a year on this loan, yep. but but your debt service here is ridiculously good because all you're you're including there is that you're you're using ninety grand. All right, so equals ninety thousand dollars divided by this plus taxes plus insurance. All right, so you're at one three two five. At the same time, the bank is at one one six. Same deal. And your rate's higher. First of all, you know, 30 years gives you a, an advantage. You know, if you can get the bank to agree to 30 years, you jumped up a little bit. You're still 10 bips higher on your DSCR for a much higher rate. A point and a quarter, technically, a point and a quarter higher rate will give you a much better DSCR. And you can qualify at one, right? So now if we work this backwards, what loan amount is, is one? What can you actually get from the bank? So, so what, what's interesting, though, is that this kind of breaks down the difference of saying, like, listen... And for everyone or you guys watching, and obviously there's a couple other questions I want to dive into as well. Um, this is giving you an idea that 
this is to get a loan, right? Like it's just saying that you can get a loan. And the reason why we go through this is to show you that like a lot of different, a lot of properties, if you structure with a specific type of loan, you can still get financing and you can still be possibly cash flow positive. Again, we're not saying substantially, and we're not trying to make any claims that this means that this is a good deal versus a bad deal. This is not what we're stating here. What we are stating is that you can get a loan and cash flow day one. Now on this deal that David, that you're looking on right now, if you, uh, you're saying property value is 780,000, current loan amount, uh, you said 546. You, you'd only be, ca like you'd have to be putting down 200 and 250,000 bucks to cash flow five grand a year. I mean, it's not exactly like it's a heavy, it's a, you know, a ton of cash flow day one, but it is possible to get a loan. You can buy the property. And if you do believe there's a lot of intrinsic value that can be added, you know, now we can start diving into the second piece of it, which is, is it a good deal or not to be pitching out? We're specifically right. in this instance, what you're talking about, David, is just about the ability of getting a loan and the differences between that ability or lack of the ability to get a loan. And obviously right. both of these circumstances give you two different, you know, two variable uh, different options, which is a bank loan, Think about it, like it just depends on the person who you're trying to sell the deal to, right? If this is a brand new investor, right? Who maybe doesn't have a ton of money, uh, do doesn't have a ton of experience buying deals, but might have a few hundred grand in the bank and is looking to buy their first deal. You might want to advise them to go DSCR. They can buy the property. You might tell them there's some upside if there's actually any upside and they can go into buying the deal. However, the more savvy investors are probably going to typically want to go for a bank loan because that means less interest and a, a better overall loan, which means they're, you know, they should be cash flowing a little bit heavier. So both have its pros and cons, right? But this is specifically just talking about the ability in which somebody has to getting uh, or really acquiring the property. A couple quick questions to throw at you because I know you're doing a lot of math here. So I'm gonna let you keep doing this. So Chris, Chris is asking, is this after a, their stress test? Because you had mentioned something called a stress test where they would you know, try to stress it in a, bu a diff bunch of different directions. Is okay. this specific example before or after the stress test? This specific example is before the stress test. Got it. So you're gonna get even less. But what I'm trying to do here is show you what you're actually, the difference in, in actuality. Let me Let me just, Good. You can, finish. You can so finish. Here, I, I, the bank the bank side is is done so you take a look at this right you know i i see this all day people come to me and be like you know what's your dscr rates so i'm like uh eight point seven five like, that, that's crazy I, the bank's give me seven seven and a half that's a point and a half less but like i'm like okay let's sit down and, and kind of calculate this you know what do you care about i mean obviously you care about interest but you care about how much cash you need to bring to the table because every dollar you're paying investors that 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 is the, your most most expensive money here you got to bring two hundred seventy three thousand dollars cash to close for your deal yes sure you save some money every year on your rate 273 grand to close that's a lot of money if you run your debt service and that's 65 ltv right 65 percent um now let's run the scenario at 80 percent all right you cannot get you know you're obviously at 80 percent. your debt service doesn't work for this but it sure as hell works for this you can get even more you're, i mean you're constrained because it's 80 but in, in you can get even more than this. You you'd get you'd be getting eighty percent, which would give you a loan amount. You just, of, you just have to change the cash to close. Yeah, so a much of um, six twenty four, and your cash to close is one fifty six. That's one hundred and twenty thousand dollars less you're paying investors every year. Now you got to calculate what costs you more, this or that. Isn't that crazy? Right, it's one hundred and twenty thousand dollars difference out of pocket. Now, can you scroll down real fast because I just want to see the DSCR? Yeah, fifty eight thousand. So you're losing three grand a month. But if you know the ability, if you know the your ability to increase rents is available, right? And you can all of a sudden take that gross income, you know, from 90 grand to 100 grand or 120 grand, all of a sudden you're in the net positive and your overall cost is, you know, technically- Yeah, so you're paying six, six, $7,000 a, a, a year more, but what are you saving on, on, on 150 grand to investors? I mean, I get, I, I would bet you're paying them more than 7% these days, right? 70, exactly. uh, you, you'd be saving, you know, 20,000, 30,000. You'd be a saving year. a lot more. Well, I'm saying, you're, I'm saying yeah. your debt service is only 60, uh, you know, 58 grand out of pocket per year and your net income is 55, five. And I'm saying you're only losing three grand a year. And that's if you change nothing about the deal. Like you could possibly have Correct. much more income coming in, you know, from maybe, you know, vacancies or anything else. So, you know, rental increases that are going up, like three grand is not hard to bridge. You know, they were talking about $250 a month extra in income, which you can probably find from somewhere. So, this is a fantastic option. Dominique is asking you, David, is there a structural reserve requirement or repair requirement? No, nothing, zero. Again, you're, you're, you're asking a logical question and this, this program, these programs don't necessarily have logical answers. Like 
what if you actually do need a new roof or you're going to need a new roof next year? Like, is nobody thinking about that? The answer is the bank doesn't care in this case. Usually they do DSER programs are programs where nobody cares. Now you so should what, care because you're the owner, but so nobody what is cares. The, the biggest thing to look out for if I know that I can get a loan, like if I'm looking and I want a good deal, David, right? Like I'm a new investor. I'm your friend. I'm your, you know, uh, uh, I'm your family member. I'm coming to you and I say, David, I got a few hundred grand in the bank. I don't have great, t- you know, financials. I want to buy a property. I'm interested in investing in real estate. I want to buy a good deal. What are some things you're mentioning to me that I should be looking out for when it comes to these DSCR deals? You know, look, look out for for gross cash flow. Look out for net cash flow. Look out for multifamilies. Don't don't get swayed by commercial deals that give you high cap rates because your cash on cash returns may be much much lower because you're only getting 65 percent or 70 percent versus 80. So look for multifam, look for small mixed use, um, run these numbers. I mean, this is a key factor. Now, there, there are more pieces to this puzzle. Obviously, you got, we didn't figure out your cash on cash return. Um, and if we want to, we can, we can continue this next week, kind of building out how to complete the underwriting. This is just from the kind of one piece, which is the bank side. But look at DSCR. Don't look at rate. Here, here, here's my takeaway today. Don't look at rate. rate. Rate is the last thing you should be looking at in a loan. I know that sounds crazy. You know, first question most people ask, especially guys new to the business are, what's your rate versus what's your rate? That is a completely, uh, that's a newbie question. You know, people who have been doing this know to look at the other factors. What's the loan? What's, what's your proceeds? What are your costs? The CMBS legal bill is about $35,000, $40,000. These DSCR loans have no legal bill versus uh, up to $1,500, depending on the state. When you look at your net, look at your actual net out of pocket, because ultimately that's what matters, right? Uh, what is your money out? What is your cash flow in? What is your return on your money out of your pocket? Correct.